Hi, my name, is, my name is Manuel Copas, and today I'm going to be talking about ancestry and sex bias in global genomics datasets. This is a talk I'm giving at Queen Mary University, London, on the 5th of October 2023. So some of you may have come across this very influential article that came out in 2016 by Alice Popejoy whereby what they did was to basically analyze the ancestry of existing genome-wide association studies. Uh, that is studies that are used to analyze and find genetic markers for complex diseases. And what they found is that from 2009 up to 2016, the amount of European ancestry that existed in uh, all data sets was overwhelming. And obviously, uh, some of it was uh, left to other non-European ancestries, most of it Asian, and there was a significant underrepresentation of uh, peoples from other populations other than European. And after that, we've had further research where by analyzing again uh, genome-wide association studies, it seems that actually the proportion of Europeans within those data sets has raised from 2016 to uh, uh, 2021 with uh, increasing the representation from 81% to 86%. So in other words, the proportion of samples from underrepresented populations have either stagnated or decreased. And this work has been conclusively shown by Fatumo et al. So here you can see how the growth of genome-wide association study uh, ancestry individuals uh, break down, you can see the growth. And in red, you can see the Europeans. And then on the right-hand side, you can actually see the actual global population. So there are around a billion Europeans. And so you can see that they dominate most of the data that exists in genome-wide association studies. And why, first of all, we all know that there is a lot of bias, but really, why, why is it so important? And not only just to uh, us Europeans, whether uh, as Europeans, but for humankind. The most important reason is that we need diverse representation so that we really can understand the genetic data as, as it is. Because at the moment, the biases that have been produced from European populations are really impairing our ability to really understand what are the, the actual causal uh, mutations in, in disease, for instance. Also, there is this question of, of fairness and justice where the benefits of genomics should be applicable to all individuals in all backgrounds. And so it is necessary, therefore, to avoid bias and, and the representation of, of those populations that are lacking on, on that representation. And also, um, the fact that if we aim to have more diversity in these data sets, then the applicability of this information will enable a lot more precise diagnosis, treatment, and risk assessment for individuals from different backgrounds. But after this kind of analysis, I've actually been involved in the uh, basically uh, surveying existing global genomics data sets to see that actually then the representation is not just for that specific type of data set genome wide association studies. It's also, as we saw, uh, very, very important in pharmacogenomics. That is the understanding of mutations or variants in genes that are involved in the metabolization of uh, drugs. And we performed the passing of the main data source that we have for um, drug reactions, which is FarmGKB, uh, which is, contains uh, several thousands of of drug interactions and, and it contains about 5 million individuals. From the 5 million individuals that have been counted within the 
from GKB, we were able to uh, unequivocally assign uh, an ancestry to about 2.5 million, about 50.1%. And what we saw again is that there is a vast underrepresentation of non Europeans, with East Asians actually doing a little bit better uh, in terms of their representation with regards uh, if we compare them to genome wide association studies. But the proportions of the other um, ancestries, such as Africans, Central and South Asian, Latino, Near Eastern, or Indigenous, they remain pretty much at the same level as what we saw for um, GWAS. And then also we, we see that um, actually in some instances, there's less representation as time goes by. So if we were to actually represent this information uh, with regards to the actual percentage of the type of, of the global population, so we have that um, Europeans are around 14% of the global population. So there are, there's a billion Europeans and they basically encompass 63.5% of all existing genomics data sets in pharmacogenomics. Is Asians, so they are around 22% of the global population and then um, there is a 28%. So we can see here that um, there are clearly big imbalances in terms of the representation versus the actual uh, global population. Um, what I found actually striking from, from this uh, presentation, from this figure, was actually that even though the least amount of uh, representation that we have is for indigenous American, since there are only about 50 million of them, uh, when we then compare the proportion between the, their actual population and the data that exists for them, they are incredibly underrepresented. But actually, given the amount of population that there is for Central and South Asia, so that is India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and those kind of countries, they are actually the least underrepresented group, which to me was counterintuitive because I expected, you know, like indigenous Americans and Latinos would be the least represented. But that obviously, is um, a caveat because um, as we'll see later here, this is just another representation of what I was showing you earlier. So if we were to represent one-to-one -one in terms of the number, the actual size of the population and the representation in existing data sets, then we could say that actually East Asia is slightly more represented than, than it should be, whereas the Africans and the others are very much underrepresented. But of course, if we are just looking at the raw numbers, so the population size uh, versus the number of individuals that exist, that doesn't really do justice to the problem of, of underrepresentation. And that's because even though in Africa there may be, let's say, 20%, uh, 21% of the population, their variability in their genomes is actually much greater than the rest of the world combined. So in other words, with fewer individuals represented, for non-Africans, we get better representation. And because there's so much variability within the African continent, we actually need to have a much greater proportion of individuals present representing the whole African continent for us in order to really survey and, and include all of the potential variants that could influence the um, pharmacogenomics. And I, and I expect that would be the same for, for, for other types of, of data, such as genome you know, wide association studies and so on. Therefore, the genetic variability in genes encoding drug metabolizing enzymes may contribute actually to the high number of adverse drug reactions that are reported in Africa. Let me give you some examples, specific examples where we can see that actually this underrepresentation is having consequences in people's health and 
life expectancy as a consequence of that. Let's look, for instance, at CYP2D6, which is actually uh, probably the most important gene in pharmacogenomics because it's basically involved in the metabolism of more than 25% of all registered drugs. So in other words, all prescribed drugs, or about 25% of all prescribed drugs um, use or are metabolized by CYP2D6, which is a type of uh, cytochrome. And the type of drugs that are represented and metabolized by this gene include antidepressants, beta blockers, antipsychotics, and antiarrhythmics. And an instance of the type of drug that could be uh, used, uh, that is metabolized with this gene is coding. But coding is kind of interesting because for some countries, for instance, we find that in Ethiopia, there is a prevalence of a duplication that causes serious adverse outcomes. And it affects around 30% of Ethiopians. And therefore, their use of this drug, which is really common, I'm sure you all have had it at some point, is banned in Ethiopia simply because they can't afford to do the broad genotyping, it's not feasible, and therefore they don't have this drug, it's banned, and so they are not benefiting from, 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 from a substance that, that will help many, many people for many symptoms. We also have another example uh, involving this gene, which is uh, three alleles, I'm not gonna name them, but you can see uh, here are the references where this information comes from. There are three alleles that actually promote poor treatment outcomes for patients with breast cancer who are treated with tamoxifen. And this is uh, applicable to some African populations. So this only happens in, in African populations. So why, coming back to the metab metabolism of coding, why is this important? I mean, as we have seen, Coding is a very common drug, which is used mostly to relieve pain. It's also used for some uh, endemic uh, diseases from, from people of African ancestry, such as sickle cell anemia is really good for controlling the pain. But what we find is that the ability to metabolize this drug, particularly in Africans, and, and, but also in other uh, ethnic backgrounds is severely or greatly different from that of Europeans, which is the main sort of algorithms from which dosage is derived from. So we have metabolizer ability who are poor and uh, we find that um, five to 10% patients in Europeans um, have these, these um, phenotype, although we think that is reduced in Africans. But I want to bring your attention to the ultra rapid because the, the ones where we have most problem is mostly the poor, because if, if you basically give them the drug, then you are not going to have pain relief. But when we have ultra rapid, then the, the effects, the adverse drug reactions can be a, a lot more severe with uh, potential toxicity and it can even concentrate uh, translate into fa fatal concentrations in breast milk or even um, uh, respiratory arrest. And we find that about 28% of North Africans, Ethiopian and 10% of Arabs have this uh, ultra rapid metabolism of coding. So if, if you give them a very tiny amount then they are going to basically suffer potentially adverse reactions. So that's a very clear example where we don't have the appropriate mechanisms to be able to cater for the needs of non-Europeans for this particular drug. I also wanted to bring the attention to another important drug called warfarin which is a leading drug for cardiovascular disease worldwide. It's basically anticoagulant. And we find that among the top, it's among the top four drugs leading to hospitalization from adverse drug reactions in South Africa. And that's for a particular uh, study, but we know that it's actually across the whole, across the board in, in Africa. 
And the other problem that we have is that the studies that we have for warfaring comes from for, for Africans comes mostly from African Americans, uh, which have a significant degree of a mixture and they are not representative of the diversity of the um, African continent. So when we use uh, risk predictions, which can be really useful for um, avoiding over anticoagulation uh, in Europeans, that actually works approximately in 20, uh, uh, it basically benefits around 18 to 24 of Europeans. Whereas non-Europeans can benefit from this because we really don't have uh, the proper understanding uh, or data to be able to uh, assign a proper dosage based on based on other ethnicities. But it's not just uh, pharmacogenomics. There's also uh, polygenic risk cause, which have been extremely well developed recently as a consequence to assign weights to complex genetic markers coming from genome-wide association studies. They are very useful for stratifying individuals for complex diseases according to their genetic risk. And when we actually compare the 17 quantitative traits uh, that are most, some, some representative uh, quantitative traits from the UK Biobank, we then apply them to how well they compare in terms of predicting uh, risk as opposed to the Europeans, we find that for Africans, they are the least well suited to benefit from the prediction accuracy of polygenic risk calls. But what is more, I've been talking just about ancestry, but also there are gender and sex uh, underrepresentation. And this is a lot more difficult to actually find for other data sets. And for instance, as far as we know, there's nothing published for genome-wide association studies. I'm also looking into uh, other big data repositories. There's no information that I've been able to retrieve regarding sex and, and gender bias. We were able to do that for FAMGKB in pharmacogenomics. And what we found is that there is a strong bias in pharmacogenomics. And this is due because women experience adverse drug reactions nearly as twice, nearly twice as often as men. Yet the roles of gender and sex as biological and social factors also uh, might increase the risk of adverse drug reactions. And due to greater life expectancy in many regions of the world, then women are more likely to require polypharmacy and suffer the associated health risks increased as a consequence of a health burden. And so we found that most drugs withdrawn from the market increase health risk for women. And this is consistent with the poor representation of women in clinical trials. In fact, women represent only 38% of participants in drug efficacy and pharmacogenomic, pharmacokinetic studies. For instance, uh, in 192 clinical trials of individuals with chronic kidney disease, only 45% of tri trial participants were women, whereas women were actually 33% more likely than men to suffer from chronic kidney disease. Moreover, uh, for long-term management of chronic, chronic pains using opioids, women experience about 50 to 70 percent increased risk of adverse drug reaction compared to men. And then there are adverse physical and mental health effects, such as morphine-induced respiratory depression, etc., which are observed more frequently in women. We also know that sex also modifies the effects of variants with the risk of genotypes in OPRM1 and COMT, leading to different adverse drug reactions at significantly different rates in males and females. But this is not the only way um, 
underrepresentation is happening because we also find that there is underrepresentation in the genomics workforce. So as part of a work that I've been involved with, with the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, which is probably one, certainly a, a trend set uh, uh, standard policy um, organization, international organization, uh, most influential genomics institutions are behind this um, organization. They have a, 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 they're well known in, in genomics. You may not have heard of, but um, it's it's basically a good representation of existing institutions contributing to the global policy generation on on genomics for health. And so, uh, when we actually look at the thousands of individuals inside that compose the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, uh, we found that actually there is an overwhelming underrepresentation of women. For instance, uh, we find that only 18% of, uh, of people, uh, we are talking in the thousands, identify themselves as women. And even when we look at it at the steering committee, so people in, in leadership, there is a very similar underrepresentation of women with an overwhelming the presence of, of males. Uh, but also if we actually look at where people from the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health come from, uh, they, they they mostly come from the Anglosphere. So the Anglosphere, I mean, Canada, US, British Isles, and uh, Australia, and New Zealand, we find that the vast majority of representation within the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health are based in Anglo countries with uh, non-Anglo countries, um, interestingly, uh, being the majority in the steering committee. So, but again, so there's, there's a strong underrepresentation here of, of non-Anglo Anglo countries. But there is also underrepresentation in people who access direct to consumer genetic testing. Uh, this is an experiment that we carried out uh, a few years ago, 2017, where we basically downloaded, we, we, we crawled the internet and downloaded, curated uh, all of the existing genotypes from uh, one of the leading uh, direct-to-consumer provider called 23andMe. So we ended up with 2,280 uh, well-curated um, uh, non-redundant uh, existing uh, genotype information that have decided to share their, their genomic data. And then we perform a, an ancestry analysis where by looking at another uh, reference population from the thousand genomes projects, we basically inferred the number of individuals from the three main um, ancestry, so African, Asian, and European. We found almost 95% of all the genotypes that have been freely shared on the internet, mostly actually coming from, from a data resource called uh, OpenSNP, 95% were European, and then uh, around 2% uh, African, 2% Asian. So, so basically, again, uh, this is telling us that there are mostly European people who are accessing um, you call it recreational genomics, but you know it's 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 a sort of prelude of the um, precision medicine adoption uh, in 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 European countries that we don't see in in other parts of the world. So, what this all means then is that for people who are from underrepresented populations. We can't really provide them uh, accurate risks of genetics, not only because we don't have enough data to, to be able to calculate those risks as precisely as with Europeans, but also that even when we try to, to, to use any kind of, of accuracy description, it underperforms so bad that it's probably better not, not to use them. So, um, 
because of that, then we also find the fact that research studies do not include underrepresented populations because they provide low statistical power. And, and these biases are also associated with medical practices being informed and benefiting only a subset of individuals. So what are the current barriers and limitations that is really hampering this increase increase on, on, on diversity. So on the one hand, we also ha we have limited lack of uh, time or resources for meaningful engagement. There also may be social political structure and language related barriers. There's a lack of awareness of this work and there is the impression that this work is not designed for one's population. Also, it's very, very difficult as we are seeing in this particular work that uh, there is very difficult to measure the diversity because most of the data sets that we've tried to look at have very limited information with regards to the different uh, types of uh, diverse populations that you might want to, 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 to research on. So what can we do about this? First of all, um, we need to think about mitigating potential harms that scientific research creates, and then also trying to remove systematic barriers and biases to, in order to enable individuals to have just and fair opportunities to access scientific advancement. In terms of specific actions that could be recommended, you know, we need to increase the awareness uh, in, in healthcare providers, but also eliminate cultural biases with stereotypical language. We need financial support to avoid discrimination of poor uh, groups. And then we need standards where the studies are designed with a minimum set of equality, diversity, and inclusion when testing patients. I think that could be a very strong uh, incentive for, for research scientists in order to, to improve uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Moreover, it's also uh, necessary to address the regulatory uncertainty because, for instance, we know that there are many tests, many genetic tools that are used which are clearly underrepresented. You know, I can think of, for instance, arrays or uh, genetic um, databases which they are already biased towards Europeans, and and unless we do something about it, they they are going to perpetuate those biases. We also need to augment the evidence base and include more diverse ancestral and sex data sets, and also reduce barriers to clinical adoption by providing relevant infrastructure, resources, training, support, as well as increasing transparency. That is, there should be some kind of requirement where data and results openly in terms of EDI uh, progress are shared in the public. And, and, and this will help us understand where the gaps are. So in terms of what we have learned with all of this analysis, first of all, I'd say that we know that there are biases. However, we don't know uh, how, uh, how to actually quantify all of them. We've only started scratching the, the surface. Of, of what's out there. And simply, as I said, because we lack the metadata to allow us to be able to characterize the biases. Also, uh, there are many, many groups for which we have no idea um, how genetic data can be applied to them. I can think, for, for instance, of disabled people, deaf, blind, but also I can, see, uh, I can think of uh, pregnant women, for instance. There, there are no clinical trials uh, where uh, we we have data from from pregnant women, and we know that they they are going to have a different hormonal composition, and that's going to have an effect in their ability to respond to treatments. Um, we also don't know how biases affect different diseases. For instance, we know that coronary artery disease perhaps might be more prevalent in the developed world. There are other um, ancestries that, for, ex for instance, are more affected by diabetes type 2. Um, we still don't know how well the results that we got for each of those diseases uh, represent the different populations. Perhaps by understanding the, the imbalances at a granular level of disease, 
we might be able to have much better prioritization of what should be the the diseases that need uh, uh, most uh, urgent attention. Also, we don't know how many different genetic annotations there are relevant for different populations. Uh, we see, for instance, uh, public data sets, public databases such as, such as CleanVa. Uh, a lot of the time, we have no idea that you know what proportion of those are applicable to different uh, uh, ancestries. We also uh, have seen that South Asian, proportionally speaking, are the least well represented. But given their background, that is more homogeneous than Africans, we still would need more uh, proportion of, of Africa, more diversity of, of African genomes, given that they are the most um, variant of all genomes that, that exist. As I said, there's hardly any research on indigenous population, and we have a poor record of engagement with them, which has led to a lot of mistrust from, from, from their leaders who would rather not share those data sets because they don't want to, to be abused as, as they have been in the past. We, we also think that probably the biggest barrier is actually how expensive this is. So while at the moment it's kind of becoming accessible, um, you know, even the thousand dollars genome for for people who are not in the first world, it's a, 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 an irredeemable, an irredeemable, an inaccessible uh, cost that people cannot afford. That. I mean, they would rather do something else with that money. And of course, poorer people have no access to direct to consumer. They don't have no access to precise algorithm dosages, and they don't have. Uh, reference data sets with which to compare how well a specific genetic risk would uh, figure uh, with them. So in summary, in this presentation, I've given you a representation of the proportion of the genomic data available for different ancestral population and also their actual proportions with respect to data repositories for pharmacogenomics and genome-wide association studies. Also, I've touched a little bit in, on um, polygenic risk scores, direct to consumer. We've analyzed as well the diversity of researchers in the genomic field. And the fact that we have a, a poor inclusivity of diverse populations in the workforce that also is actually introducing uh, a lack of, of questions that would be relevant to them. And as uh, Eric Green from the NIH, NIH has uh, pointed out, uh, we are basically missing uh, a workforce who would have a different view and an understanding that would be applicable to the benefit of, of all humankind by having more diverse data sets. I've also provided some clear examples of where underrepresented populations are suffering the consequences of the lack of inclusion. For instance, I was talking about warfaring. How is, uh, you know, is the fourth uh, biggest adverse drug reaction uh, drug that we have in, in, in Africa. And so this is a clear example where people are really being affected by that. So people are not getting the, the treatment. People are not having uh, poorer life conditions, even, even death, because of this uh, imbalance in the data sets that we have. And then in conclusion, I have some conclusions to mention. So first of all, uh, just to remind you something that we all, all know, that as genomics plays an increasingly significant role in healthcare, it's imperative that the field's insights and benefits are available to everyone, irrespective of ancestry, sex, or you name what, national origin, sexual orientation, whatever. Quantifying global genomics, data underrepresentation and biases is therefore critical for understanding the current state of the art in genomic research at and ensuring the broad applicability of his finding, which is not just going to benefit than the represented populations, the represented populations as well. We have an incentive in, in the first world 
to, to, to facilitate that access to, to, to those populations. And failure to do so can lead to inequities and a lack of understanding of disease, which will affect us all, as I say. And in closing, I just want to have some, some ethical grounding of, of why, why we all have the right to science. We all have the rights to benefit from, from the research, not just a, a particular population. The Article 15 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights requires states to recognize the rights of everyone to enjoy the benefits of scientific progress and its applications, conserve, develop, diffuse science, respect the freedom indispensable for scientific research, and recognize the benefits of international contacts and cooperation in the scientific field. And because of that, everyone has the right to benefit from the fruits of genomic science. With that, I'd like to say thank you for your attention and I appreciate um, any, any kind of questions you might have, uh, feel free to ask me. I'll be here and I look forward to um, engaging with you in the near future again. Thanks very much.